Now we will begin part A with the first conversation. Number one. Do you want to go on a trip with us to Florida this spring? It'll cost about three hundred dollars a person. Three hundred dollars? Do you think I just inherited a fortune? What can be inferred about the man? Number two. My watch stopped again, and I just got a new battery. Why don't you take it to Smith Jewelry? They can check it for you, and they're pretty reasonable. What does the man mean? Number three. We're going to change our meeting from Monday to Tuesday. It's all the same to me. What does the man mean? Number four. We plan to go to the beach after class. Want to come? I'd love to, but Professor Jones wants to speak with me. What will the woman probably do? Number five. Janet sounded worried about her grades. But she's getting A's and B's, isn't she? What does the man imply about Janet? Number six. You look great since you've been taking those exercise classes. Thanks. I've never felt better in my life. What does the man imply? Number seven. I had a hard time getting through this novel. I know how you feel. Who can remember the names of thirty-five different characters? What does the woman imply? Number eight. That's a long line. Do you think there'll be any tickets left? I doubt it. Guess we'll wind up going to the second show. What does the woman mean? Number nine. This course is much too hard for me. Sorry you decided to take it, huh? What does the man ask the woman? Number ten. Are you going home for winter vacation? I've agreed to stay on here as a research assistant. What can be inferred about the woman? Number eleven. Hello. Hello, this is Dr. Gray's office. We're calling to remind you of your 4:15 appointment for your annual checkup tomorrow. Oh, thanks. It's a good thing you called. I thought it was 4:15 today. What does the man mean? Number twelve. How wonderful! You won the scholarship. Can you believe it? No, it's almost too good to be true. What does the man mean? Number thirteen. Excuse me, Professor Davidson, but I was hoping to talk to you about my class project for economics. I have a class in a few minutes. Why don't you come and see me during office hours tomorrow? When will the woman discuss her project with Professor Davidson? Number fourteen. How are you feeling? The stuff the nurse gave me seems to have helped, but it's making me awfully drowsy. What does the woman mean? Number fifteen. Bill Smith has volunteered to write a summary of the proposals we've agreed on. Will I have a chance to review it? What does the woman want to know? Number sixteen. Why don't you wear that yellow shirt that your sister gave you for your birthday? I love that shirt, but it's missing two buttons. What does the man mean? Number seventeen. How many classes do you have today? Just one, from three till six. What does the man mean? Number eighteen. Our football team didn't play very well. That's true, but at least we won the game. What does the man mean? Number nineteen. This has been an unusually cool summer. Uh huh. I actually had to get out my wool sweaters in August. What does the woman imply? Number twenty. 
I got some bad news today. The store where I work is laying off staff. Are they going to let you go? What does the woman want to know? Go on to the next page. Number 21. I'd like to pick this film up by four tomorrow afternoon. I can have it for you at two if you'd like. What does the woman say about the film? Number 22. I talked to Philip today, and he said he'd be coming to the party. Oh, so he can come after all. What can be inferred about Philip? Number 23. Gary insists on buying the food for the picnic. That's pretty generous, but shouldn't we at least offer to share the expense? What does the woman suggest they do? Number 24. How's the new job going? Well, I'm getting used to lots of new things, but I wish the supervisor would give me some feedback. What does the woman mean? Number 25. Did Linda ever finish that introductory chapter? I'm not sure. She spent hours on end rewriting it. What does the man imply about Linda? Number 26. The supermarket down the street is selling everything half price because we're going out of business. Sounds like an ideal time to stock up on coffee. What does the man mean? Number 27. Have you heard anything about the new professor? Just that she's no pushover. What does the man say about the professor? Number 28. I need to get a copy of my birth certificate. Sorry, but we can only accept requests by mail now. What does the woman mean? Number 29. When's the earliest flight from Washington to New York? There's a shuttle at 6, and if that's full, there's another at 7. What does the man mean? Number 30. How would you like to help me plan the refreshments for the astronomy club meeting tomorrow night? Sure. Let's be careful not to overdo it, though. Last time we had enough for three clubs put together. What does the woman mean? This is the end of Part A. Now we will begin Part B with the first conversation. Questions 31 through 33. Listen to a conversation between two friends who meet on the street. David, can I give you a hand with one of those grocery bags? Sure, Nancy. Could you take this one, please? I didn't realize how heavy these bags would be. Why'd you buy so much stuff when you have to walk home from the store? Well, I didn't intend to buy a lot, but I'm having some people over, and I guess I needed more than I expected. What's the occasion? Well, the people I live with, the Kramers, have been on vacation for a month, and I thought I'd surprise them. I'm inviting some of their friends and family for a welcome home dinner. That's really thoughtful of you. I figure it's the least I can do for them. They've been letting me stay with them rent-free while I'm in school. Really? That's pretty generous of them. Well, they understand how difficult it is to make ends meet when you're a student. They've been such a big help to me. I thought that this might be a small way to thank them for their generosity. Number 31. What is David trying to do? Number 32. Why did David think he wouldn't have a problem? Number 33. Why is David appreciative of the Kramers? Questions 34 through 37. Listen to a conversation between two friends. Hey, how was your trip? Wonderful. I spent most of my time at the art museum. I especially like the new wing. I was amazed to hear the guide explain all the problems they had building it. Right. I just read an article that went on and on about the cost. Ninety million total, I think. Yeah, the guide mentioned that. You could see they spared no expense. Hmm. It looked really unusual, at least from what I saw in the picture. It is. The basic design is two triangles. In fact, there are triangles all over. 
the paving stones in the courtyard, the skylights, and even a lot of the sculptures. One sculpture is a mobile. It's in the courtyard, and it's made of pieces of aluminum that move slowly in the air. It's really impressive. That was in the article, too. It said the original was steel, and it weighed so much that it wasn't safe to hang. Right. They did it over in aluminum, so it wouldn't come crashing down on someone's head. You know, the article went into that in detail. There was even an interview with the sculptor. I'd like to read that. Would you mind if I borrow the magazine sometime? No, I wouldn't mind, if I haven't thrown it out yet. Number 34. What did the woman think of the new wing of the museum? Number 35. How had the man learned about the museum? Number 36. According to the woman, what do the paving stones, skylights, and mobile have in common? Number 37. What was the problem with the original mobile? This is the end of Part B. Now we will begin Part C with the first talk. Questions 38 through 41. Listen to an announcement in a university class. In the few minutes that remain of today's class, I'd like to discuss next week's schedule with you. Because I'm presenting a paper at a conference in Detroit on Thursday, I won't be here for either Wednesday's or Friday's class. I will, however, be here for Monday. Next Friday, a week from today, is the midterm exam, marking the halfway point in the semester. Professor Andrews has agreed to administer the exam. In place of the usual Wednesday class, I've arranged an optional review session. Since it is optional, attendance will not be taken. However, attending the class would be a good idea for those worried about the midterm. So remember, optional class next Wednesday. Midterm, Friday. Number 38. What is the purpose of the talk? Number 39. At what point during the semester does this talk take place? Number 40. What did Professor Andrews agree to do? Number 41. What will occur at next Wednesday's class time? Questions 42 through 46. Listen to part of a talk given in an anthropology class. Today's lecture will center on prehistoric people of the Nevada desert. Now, most of these prehistoric desert people moved across the countryside throughout the year. You might think that they were wandering aimlessly. Far from it. They actually followed a series of carefully planned moves. Where they moved depended on where food was available, places where plants were ripening or fish were spawning. Now, often when these people moved, they carried all their possessions on their back. But if the journey was long, extra food and tools were sometimes stored in caves or beneath rocks. One of these caves is now an exciting archaeological site. Beyond its small opening is a huge underground grotto. And even though the cave is very large, it was certainly too dark and dusty for the travelers to live in. But it was a great place to hide things and tremendous amounts of food supplies and artifacts have been found there. The food includes dried fish, seeds, and nuts. The artifacts include stone spear points and knives. The spear points are actually rather small. Here's a picture of some that were found. You can see their size in relation to the hands holding them. Number 42. What is the main subject of this talk? Number 43. What point does the speaker make about the prehistoric people of the Nevada desert? Number 44. Why didn't people live in the cave described by the speaker? Number 45. What have archaeologists found in the cave? Number 46. 
Why does the speaker show a photo to the class? Questions 47 through 50. Listen to part of a lecture given in a marine biology class. To us, the environment in which fish dwell often seems cold, dark, and mysterious. But there are advantages to living in water, and they've played an important role in making fish what they are. One is that water isn't subject to sudden temperature changes. Therefore, it makes an excellent habitat for a cold-blooded animal. Another advantage is the water's ability to easily support body weight. Protoplasm has approximately the same density as water, so a fish in water is almost weightless. This weightlessness, in turn, means two things. One, a fish can get along with a light weight and simple bone structure. And two, limitations to a fish's size are practically removed. Yet there is one basic difficulty to living in water, the fact that it's incompressible. For a fish to move through water, it must actually shove it aside. Most can do this by wiggling back and forth in snake-like motion. The fish pushes water aside by the forward motion of its head and with the curve of its body and its flexible tail. Next, the water flows back along the fish's narrowing sides, closing in at the tail and helping the fish propel itself forward. The fact that water is incompressible has literally shaped the development of fish. A flat and angular shape can be moved through water only with difficulty. And for this reason, fish have a basic shape that is beautifully adapted to deal with this peculiarity. Number 47. What is the talk mainly about? Number 48. What does the speaker mention as a problem that water presents to fish? Number 49. The speaker compares a fish's movement with that of what creature? Number 50. What aspect of a fish does the speaker discuss in the most detail? This is the end of Section 1, Listening Comprehension.